All right, and good afternoon, everyone. This is Ryan Miller with NCBPA, welcoming you to today's webinar on building envelope best practices. We've got a whole bunch of information uh, for you folks today for the next hour and a half or so. Um, thank you for being with us. Uh, we are recording here live um, remotely, of course, uh, August 20th, 2019, and we've got four great presenters for you all today. So I will be getting things started here with a little bit of introductory information, um, and then we'll move on to our presenters. So first off, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, NCBPA, the Building Performance Association, we do webinars generally at least one per month uh, on various topics. Uh, Passive House was, I believe, our last one. And I think today's webinar on building envelope, we have 83 people registered and more signing in as we get started here. So um, I think it's a very popular topic and we're happy to be doing that. Um, on the screen, you should be able to see just a nice picture of Raleigh. And then over on the right there, that is going to be a uh, new building being constructed by SFLA Architects, one of our member companies, it'll be a net positive building and should be the most energy efficient, high performance building in the entire country, uh, breaking ground in the next couple of months here near downtown Raleigh. So uh, building envelope systems will be very important to that building. I know that a lot of our members are going to be participating in that project. So just wanted to point out some of the importance with um, today's subject matter to a lot of us, I think. So as far as the webinar for today, um, we're going to keep everyone on mute for the duration uh, up until the very, very end. That just helps us avoid some background noise and things like that um, as we get started with the presenters so that they can get through their slides. Um, if you do have any questions, please use the chat box feature to do that. You should see that little window in GoToMeeting, and you can uh, ask the presenters questions. We can have some discussion going on there during the presentation. And then also, as, um, as we wrap up each presentation, I'll be checking that chat box to see if there are any questions. So if it's not answered immediately, um, either by the presenter or by maybe somebody else on the webinar, please just sit tight and we will get to that as soon as we can. Um, we may have to save a couple of questions to the end, but we will do our best to address those timely. Um, this webinar is being recorded on video, and so everyone that has registered for it will receive access to the video recording and also um, PDF presentation of uh, each of the slides. Um, we do have more slides uh, electronically available that are what, what will be provided today in the webinar, so you will receive all of those. And trust me, it's a lot. So be on the lookout for that. We will send it out probably this afternoon, worst case scenario, tomorrow morning after the video is done. So um, we've got lots more events and webinars and news and things like that coming out of NCBPA these days. We are very, very busy working with our member companies and partners to push building performance uh, forward in the state. Uh, please do visit our website at buildingnc.org whenever you have some time to take a look at our news page and our membership directory and our upcoming events as well. Um, you can always follow us on social media and contact us if you have any questions or need anything from us. Um, we are a membership-based association, and so if you're not already a member company, I would love to ask you to consider joining. Um, membership dues are $25 per month uh, per company uh, for about 12 months, and that $300 is the, uh, the lowest level for us. So please do consider joining when you have some time. So a little bit of introductory information for today's webinar. Um, we've got four presenters for today. Uh, Brian Clayton of uh, Southern Wall Systems will be kicking things off and kind of going into the, the residential single family and a little bit of the multifamily side of the industry here for uh, building envelope systems. Next up, we'll hear from Josh Bailey. He's with Henry Company and works all over the state in the southeast um, on different types of uh, building envelope systems. And so he'll also be covering some residential uh, multifamily and also some light commercial applications. There's a fun photo of Scott with Spirit Sales Group. He'll be covering uh, sort of the bigger building side of things, transitioning from multifamily um, into commercial buildings. And he's got lots of information to share as well. And then lastly, we've got Jarrett Davis with Max Life Industries. Um, he's got quite a bit of information also on the big building side of things um, with some new products that his company has coming out. Um, I do want to make mention now that um, you will be sold some products on this webinar. Um, if you're not expecting that, I'm sorry, you're in the wrong place. But um, here at NCBPA, we like to provide you know, industry education and information that's helpful to everyone. Um, we personally, as an association, are agnostic towards all types of products and things like that. But 
our member companies are not. So um, there will be some sales material in here and some sales slides. Um, I hope that's helpful to you all. And of course, I'd encourage you to reach out to Brian, Josh, Scott, and Jarrett after the webinar for more information about their product. So a little bit of information about NCDPA. As I mentioned before, we are a nonprofit, not-for-profit trade association, building performance companies and professionals. We work all over the state and we cover all building types. We have a residential consumer education website called homeenergync.org. You can find lots of information about home energy efficiency and home performance there. And then we also have a similar website at buildingperformancenc.org. And that allows any commercial building owner, operator, facilities manager, anybody in a non-residential building to find information about how to make it better. Over the last couple of years, um, we've been building uh, quite a bit of information and strategy around advancing our industry. On our website, under the Learn page, you can find information about some of the important reports that we've put out in the last couple of years. The business case for energy efficiency focused on policy. We did a report back in uh, 2017 basically inventorying all of the high-performance, green, and energy-efficient homes and buildings in the state and reported out on the higher sale price for residential units in particular. And then last September, about a year ago, we released the Energy Efficiency Potential Report that identified a 16.8% energy savings potential for the state. So a lot of that work is driving some areas of opportunity for us in the industry, and we at NCBPA are looking to lead as much of that with our member companies and partners working with us. And so please do again consider joining to participate in that effort. And then here's just a couple of photos um, with a link or an image down here in the bottom left of that potential report identifying just what would happen if we did um, improve the building performance and energy efficiency market to save a whole bunch of energy, create jobs, protect the environment, and build our economy. So all that information again is available on the NCBPA website. Also on our website, just one more mention, um, our board of directors has been very active about putting out some good articles and information to uh, talk about some important subjects in our industry. Um, Pam Fossa is a builder here out of the Wilmington area. She's got an article on energy codes being under uh, attack, both at the short and long term, and so you can find that on our website. Meg McDermott is our board chair. She's got an article on um, the commissioning process and then a separate one on using building science to improve North Carolina school buildings. You can find that on our website as well. And then Jonathan Gock of uh, the Greenbelt Alliance in Asheville, um, he came up with a great idea to talk about reduce, reuse, and recycle with buildings, clean energy, and electric transportation. And so we've got two articles on our website about that. And then um, earlier this year, I think last year maybe, um, we did uh, an article on talking about building performance versus building plaques. And so that's definitely an interesting subject to speak to. So um, you're not here to hear more, much more about NCBPA. We're here to get to the presentation. So I'm going to provide the agenda here. Um, you will have to stick with me just a little bit longer. When we did the prep for this webinar, we identified a need to go over some code information. So I will be presenting a very quick overview of residential and commercial building envelope code requirements here to get us started before we can move into the main presenter. So we'll do that in just a couple minutes. Um, one of our first presenters is going to be Brian Clinton. He's with Southern Wall Systems, and he'll be talking about ICF SIPs and other single-family envelope systems. Josh Bailey with Henry, he'll be talking about best practices for pre-construction meetings and multifamily systems and a couple of other topics as well. Scott Kind is with Spirit Sales Group, and he will be covering commercial air barriers, different types of transitions, and the products and services to be able to get you to high-performance building envelope systems. And then last up, we'll have Jarrett Davis of Max Life Industries. He'll be covering um, commercial and industrial continuous insulation. So that's C and I, C I, didn't realize that, fire barriers, and much, much more. So we'll be hearing from each one of those presenters for about 15 to 20 minutes, and we'll be taking questions after each one. And then at the very end of the webinar today, we will have a little bit of a discussion and open up the phone line for those interested. So um, one of the important topics for today is just how all of this relates to code. Um, wanted to provide just a quick overview of the code workshops that we've been doing um, for the last month with AIA North Carolina. Um, Megan McDermott, our board chair from High Performance Building Solutions, has been leading those presentations. I've been helping out on the residential side, and then we've had um, Will Dan uh, there to do an activity in the afternoon. You can see the cities and dates that we've already covered. Hopefully some of you all uh, attended some of these workshops. We've got one more coming up September 12th in Greenville, North Carolina. So if you did miss it, 
you can register on our website or on the AIA website as well. Um, these are the eight hour variety, and so there's a lot of code information that we've been uh, providing uh, and doing activities as well, and so we're not going to be able to cover all of that today. Uh, but if you are interested, uh, our members will have access to these presentations here soon. We're getting a little bit of clarification from the Department of Insurance on a few things. Um, and then if you're interested in bringing a code workshop to your area or your company, um, please do get in touch with me and I'll be happy to work with you to set that up. So um, I will be going over a very quick overview of residential and commercial code. Um, again, during the prep for this webinar, um, our presenters identified that as a need, and so I offered to just get this together. Um, so this will not be an educational workshop here on Energy Code. This will just be some presentation about what's changing. And then if you'd like some more information, again, please get in touch with me. Uh, first, on the Residential Energy Code side, so this is from the new North Carolina 2018 Energy Code, which again started back January 1 of this year, and it will be in place for three years for commercial and six years for residential. On the residential side, uh, we do have a change on attic knee walls they need to be backed with rigid material or an air barrier material with all joints and perimeter sealed. Also, you have to seal exterior house wrap material joints and seams in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. Or if house wrap joints are not sealed, you do need to seal the exterior sheathing and exposed band joist joints, including perimeter joints and edges of these materials. And then there are Two exceptions, one is spray foam and building envelope, uh, building thermal envelope wall systems. And secondly is wall sheathing joints where wall sheathing is fully glued to framing. So I'm going through these quickly because we don't have enough time to stop and sort of diagnose or analyze every single one. Again, folks will receive a recording of the presentation and then also a PDF with notes. So you will get this information again. Item number four on the key residential changes, insulation must be in full contact and alignment with the insulated surface, free from gaps, voids, or compression. Uh, there's a small change to framed wall insulation with a fully enclosed um, solid rigid material or approved air barrier. Those joints shall be air sealed and non-insulating class one vapor retarders such as polyethylene shall not be allowed. And then fireplaces do require a rigid barrier. And then also on the glaze fenestration exemption, uh, that just changed from 15 square feet to 24 for those glazed assemblies. Um, again, we're not going to spend much time on this today. We just wanted to highlight what's changing and encourage you to reach back out to us for more information on these and other changes. This is a very quick snapshot of the new table in the new North Carolina code. You can see items in green that have changed. And so you can see that the skylight U factor slope ceiling insulation, attic insulation in zone three, mass wall insulation, and then a couple of other items in conditioned basements have all changed. Most of those have increased a little bit. Some have decreased when it's more efficiency. Generally speaking, we've got about 1.5% more efficiency in North Carolina's new residential energy code. One additional item on the residential side is that there are a couple of uh, changes to the compliance pathways. Um, as you could in the prior code, you can still use the prescriptive method, so that is available. You can also do a HERS analysis, so that's the home energy rating analysis via the U factor area, the UA compliance report. That's another one. The cost performance pathway, I've highlighted that one here in yellow. This is the one that a lot of folks have begun to use uh, because res check is no longer available for the base code. More on that in just a second. Um, but we are getting some clarification from the Department of Insurance about um, the registered design professional and a couple of other features about this pathway. So there is some more information coming from us on that. The new one is the Energy Rating Index, the ERI. This is essentially using a HERS rating, um, a good enough score, kind of in the high 60s, in order to pass for compliance, so long as you have the minimum mandatory backstop requirements met, which is the North Carolina 2009 code table for insulation and fenestration. And then I did mention that ResCheck is only available now for 2015 IECC, so that's not our new code. But if you are pursuing something better than our new code, which is the 2015 IECC, then ResCheck is available. The same situation applies to ComCheck. Otherwise, you cannot use ResCheck or ComCheck for base North Carolina code. Okay, that was the residential update. Normally, we do that in about two and a half hours. We're moving quickly today. I want to get over to our presenters as soon as possible. So before I do that, we'll highlight a couple of items on the commercial energy code as well. There's actually more changes here, so I'll do these very quickly. Uh, number one, the building's thermal envelope shall be identified on the construction drawings. 
There's a new exception that allows garage doors that are part of the building thermal envelope to use the DASMA testing standards and protocols. There are new compliance requirements for Section 402.3 with roof solar reflectance, thermal emittance, and air leakage of building envelope assemblies. Also, greenhouses are exempt from building thermal envelope requirements in Section 402. And then there are some references to equipment buildings that have essentially been removed, so a little bit of cleanup on those two there. Item number six, the same building thermal envelope tables found in the 2012 North Carolina Conservation Code are still being used, so that is just a point of clarification. There's a new U-factor trade-off method allowed for building thermal envelope systems, and solar heat gain coefficient is not included there. For the prescriptive pathway, continuous insulation must be included with metal stud framing. New air sealing requirements where multiple layers of insulation and staggering joints is used in wallboard assemblies. There are new code definitions for opaque doors versus glazed doors. And then also air leakage design is now mandatory. So with that, I'm going to take a quick pause and um, just say that we wanted to present this information at the beginning of the webinar to highlight some key building envelope changes in residential and commercial that our presenters will be speaking to here in just a minute. So if you do have additional questions about these items or any other items in the energy code, please do reach out to me and either myself or someone else from the NCBPA team or membership will get back in touch with you. And again, we do have our one remaining workshop on September 12th in Greenville, North Carolina. You can find that information on the NCBPA website and registrations through the AIA North Carolina website. So without any further ado, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over <clears throat> to Brian Clayton with Southern Wall Systems. Um, Brian is going to be our first presenter to talk about a couple of things on residential um, building thermal envelope systems and much more that he presents to, or sorry, he works on um, all across the southeast. Uh, so um, Brian, uh, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, I got you. All right, sounds good, Brian. Well, um, I'll go ahead and advance the slides for you when you're ready. So if you don't mind, I'll offer just a little bit of introduction about who you are and what you do, and go ahead with the slides. All right, thanks, Ryan. Hi, my name is Brian Clayton, um, owner of uh, Southern Wall Systems in North Carolina. We're uh, installing contractors for the insulated concrete form industry. Uh, we've been doing it for the since the early 2000s. We've worked on uh, a multitude of projects, anywhere from small garages to uh, Army Reserve Centers, hotels, just in commercial buildings, and probably 200 plus uh, residential projects. Uh, we've been doing it since the early 2000s again. And uh, the insulated concrete form is, uh, we can go ahead and switch that slide, please, Ryan and uh, basically to the anatomy of the insulated concrete form is basically it's just a cast in place wall uh, using a stay in place form which is the icf the uh the icf is a there we have an anatomy of that block is basically two uh, panels of expanded polystyrene uh, being held together by the plastic ties, which are recyclable materials, and those are your forms. Those ties also give you the ability to attach uh, siding, sheetrock, or has attachment points, either in intervals or six to eight inches, typically. And uh, they'll run from the floor to the top of the wall most of the time continuously. So that's basically the anatomy of the block. The different, there's probably 20 some manufacturers of these blocks ranging in just the different tie systems, the different interlocks of the, uh, of the block as well as just the material. Some of them offer some of those uh, ties in a metal type of form. Uh, I think we can run over to the next slide. And basically, the uh, the the value proposition for the ICF blocks are they do a couple of things. They help reduce the cost 
lower time, first time costs by giving you um, a quicker build time. They also have a high uh, energy efficiency rating, hopefully to save you up to 50%, depending on what type of, uh, of um, thickness of EPS you use on the wall systems. Typically, you know, we have, there's a tip, a lesser uh, reduction in delays with the weather just because uh, once the footer is placed, the slabs, uh, the materials are light, you can move them around. You don't have to worry about uh, equipment having to move this stuff around. So that, that helps get in and out fairly well. Builders enjoy that aspect of it with a typical house being built maybe five days at the top uh, at, uh, on the latter part of things. They have some done a little bit faster than that. And um, it's a lower cost of ownership because of the cast in place walls that you should see um, less fatigue from or wear out from the wood in other situations. And, uh, they're they're great by giving you uh, uh it's a direct contribution for uh the lead in um sustainability part of it then go to the next slide ryan and basically the real advantages are here i mean you're getting seven building elements placed at one time by one contractor you get the structural and reinforced concrete walls that we're talking about and you can typically those concrete wall portion of the icf can go from four six eight inch 10 12 up to 16 inches um in in the width of the concrete where you can achieve 220 mile hour wind loads on that um, depending on the size of that block it, it also serves as continuous air barrier for those walls since those seams are being uh, interlocked it, it creates a really tight structure in that uh, you most of the blocks that are on the market today they use um, two and a half inches of foam. And then most of them have a energy stick or some type of additional insert that you can apply to it that you can get uh, R23 and above up to R50 and depending on those insulation inserts. It also gives you a very good vapor barrier. For the EPS, typically you'll see um, something like that 0.6 per inch and the ul ratings typically will run a four hour um, fire test and once again you get um uh the attachment or embed uh, excuse me the attachments are embedded in the uh expanded polystyrene uh typically six to eight inches and to give you attachment point for almost anything. Most of the time a screw is like a 230 pound pull out strength to it. Um, and the sound attenuation is pretty high. You don't typically hear uh, a great deal coming through those walls after I think uh, we can move on to the uh, maybe kind of show a picture of those strengths of the hurricane Katrina went through. You there, Ryan? Yep, I've got the slides moving. Might be a little bit of a delay. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so this is a house that uh, we built some condominiums down in Mississippi. This house has uh, been pretty well publicated. Um, it was 
being it being built during Katrina or prior to Katrina coming through, and uh, there was a whole lot of house levels, uh, excuse me, house that were leveled around that, and that was um, one of the the ones that withstood that, and um, the so you know the, it shows a real strength of one right there, and and the, the we you know these can be built out of just simple box designs or they can be done pretty with a lot of corners in that following picture. Um, I think I'll show you, you know, you can do radius walls. Uh, sorry, let's move. Yeah. So that's a house that was uh, built in Virginia Beach. You, typically you have a, you know, a couple of corners, but this house had some like uh, 37, 38 corners with three or four round walls to it. So you can contour, contour it to a bunch of different shapes to, to to get what you're trying to achieve there. And I think that finished me up. I mean, it takes some questions, Ryan. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Brian, for uh, going through those slides. Um, you got some pretty big houses in here that uh, using your ICF, um, which I think is uh, maybe some new information for some folks. But um, thank you for that. So yeah, we'll just take a quick pause here and see if there's any questions that folks want to put into uh, the chat box here and go to meeting. Um, if you do have a question for Brian, please go ahead and put that in here. Um, and then we'll uh, wait just a minute to see if anybody does have any questions. Um, so Brian, um, any other just kind of fun information about what you guys are working on right now or um, any recent successes or good projects you guys have had kind of in the North Carolina, South Carolina area? Yeah, yeah, and we, we do a lot of these for basements. I mean, you see a, a great application for that cast in place wall using the ICF form. Uh, so, you know, we end up doing a lot of those through the through the triangle triad and um, up towards the mountains. Uh, uh, Typically, you see a lot of this as well on the coastlines where you see, um, you know, you get some some high wind loads coming in and it's very, uh, you know, it's great to apply stucco finish as, as that house shows. Uh, we've got some schools that we're going to be doing as well later in the year. We've done a fair amount of um, different, different small commercial type of buildings, storage facilities. Uh, I think it, it offers a real, you know, especially with the thermal wicking that goes on with those concrete walls. Okay, great. Glad to hear that. Well, thank you, Brian. So I don't see any questions here, Brian, so it looks like you probably answered everything. And yeah. we'll have your contact information uh, here provided at the end of the webinar. We'll make sure everybody gets a copy of your slides as well. All right. Thank you so much, Ryan. All right. Great. Thank you, Brian. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and uh, keep rolling through here to make sure we give our, all of our presenters as much time as we can. Um, so we're going to bring in uh, Josh Bailey. He is the Territory Sales Manager with Henry Company, and he'll be walking through some of their products and what he's seen in the field and some additional uh, best practices as well um, from everything that he sees out there. So, um, Josh, I am going to unmute you and then also give you control of the keyboard so you should have that now so josh are you able to hear me okay yeah i can hear you fine ryan <laughs> all right sounds good i can hear you as well so uh feel free to have at it and offer a little bit of introduction to yourself and uh thanks very much yeah sure so just a quick introduction and then i have an introduction slide for my company so um my name is josh bailey i'm actually uh the territory sales manager for uh, uh virginia north carolina south carolina and eastern tennessee I have a direct counterpart, Ashley Rothwell, who is out of the Raleigh market. Uh, we're both on the residential light commercial side of the business and the multifamily side of the business. And then I have a uh, counter, another counterpart on the other side of the business, strictly commercial, um, Matt Willis, who is actually out of the Raleigh market too. So we have three direct sales reps for the Henry company here in the, in the North Carolina market. So uh, feel free to reach out any, to any of us and uh, we're all there to help. We act as salespeople, as technicians, technical people and uh, go-betweens between any of the sales channels. So that's a little bit about me, and uh, let's go ahead and move on through here. So this is kind of the agenda. I'm just gonna go through, I went through the introduction. We're gonna talk a little bit about a single-family, multi-family construction planning, 
and then I'm going to walk you through some of our systems. Okay. So one of the big uh, one of the things I wanted to start out with. I'm not the best joke teller, but I wanted to show some pictures that I see out in the field. Um, my counterpart actually snapped. These are all pretty pretty recent pictures, or within the past six months. But the one on the left is like not even a month old, and I'm sure you guys have kind of all driven by that Franken Franken house is what I like to call them that has about five or six different house wraps on it. So it just kind of shows you what goes on out there in the field. People will grab that 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 cheap wrap or whatever wrap they can find and throw it on the house, and they they overlook the whole system approach to the way these businesses are going nowadays. So this is an important aspect that uh, you know these people are overlooking. You know the building envelope represents about uh, less than one percent of the total cost of the house, but it it reports in the statistics that I've read over sixty eight percent of the callbacks to the to the builder. So very important aspect, but there's some pictures there. And then I had some funny ones there with the uh, Florida flash in the windows that I saw um, down in the Charleston market. Okay. So systems, um, I'm going to be driving the message home from system, whether it's my system or any of the competitive companies out there, their systems, and there's reasons why their systems. Um, compatibility is probably one of the biggest in continuity on the wall. Um, most most people, and in, in, if you ask any homeowner, they're going to want to know that they can come back to one manufacturer if they have an issue, and not have to source several different uh, different manufacturers in order to exercise a warranty or or find out about products. So that's going to be one of the biggest things that you notice in this presentation. Okay, so moving on here. So uh, pre-construction, uh, this topic kind of has been a uh, sticking point for me and several of my counterparts over the last couple of years and um, even more recent in the last month, because I'm starting to see an influx of multifamily jobs. And uh, the, important to me, the importance to me is, is that we all have line of sight on what's going on on the job. And that, that doesn't just mean me as the salesperson, but it means the architect, the builder, the uh, superintendent, um, even, even our two-step distribution partners and our channel partners, because if there's a hiccup in the, in the, in the chain, um, something can go wrong. So, Getting out there and setting up the pre-construction meetings, getting the, getting the architects and the builders, the samples and the literature that they need, um, any details, special details about the project that need to be, you know, come up, um, data sheets, and then selecting all the products that are out there. Uh, I was recently at a at a project where, uh, and this is kind of a, you know, a, a little story that I have. I was recently at a project where we used our drainable product, and uh, you know, it, it, for lack of better better words, the uh, it was kind of a dream sell because I didn't have good line of sight on the job, but at the same time, it was a double-edged sword because not having line of sight on the job, they failed to look at one of our data sheets and did not put the uh, correct um, uh, uh, with the tape on it. So luckily we caught that, but that was a hiccup in the whole thing. So if we would have had better line of sight or better communication or a pre-construction meeting or had a pre-construction meeting, we would have uh, we would have been able to cut that off the pass or if there's any address for primer or anything like that as well. Um, contact info, you know, make sure that you have everybody's uh, information on the in these pre-construction meetings. Uh, I, I've left several jobs where I've, I've uh, not actually received the contact information from the people and had to chase it back down other ways. It's a lot more efficient to get it up front. And then, you know, pertinent dates and times. What are the uh, what are the time? What's the schedule we're looking at here? You know, what's the uh, what's the plans of getting the uh, the job going and rolling? Okay. Um, mock wall training. So obviously this comes later. So one of the big things is if you can get all the trades out there that are responsible. In in my in my business, obviously for the for the building envelope, uh, we had a residential uh, a residential mock wall training not too long ago. This one was down in uh, Charleston, uh, South Carolina market on a multifamily project down there. The pictures on the right, but uh, we had one uh, in uh, in uh, um, uh, the Carolinas not too long ago where. Uh, you know, we we asked some of the trades that there was over 20 people from the trades there. And one of the things that one of the questions that popped up was to the discussion about, does anybody have a J roller, which is one of my bullet points down there. If you look, um, one guy said he had a J roller, you know, and, and important thing of having these tools and having these uh, the uh, the right stuff on the job site is very important because a lot of this flashing is pressure sensitive adhesion. So one guy was able to say that he had a roller and I'm not even sure if he had the roller. So making sure that the critical points to installation, um, going over some of the uh, the technical stuff in, in an install for a mechanically fastened house wrap or even like our peel and stick house wrap, you know, some of the stuff I'm seeing out there is a lot of people are, are, are missing the inside and outside corners and they're getting that cupping effect. 
um, knowing the uh, overlaps and the seams and the joints, and then going through the window installations, you know, it's important to know what what method they're going to use. If it's the A1, the A, the B, whatever, whatever, whatever they've chosen to do, and getting that down and, and making sure everybody understands that. You know, a lot of times in in our industry, we assume that people know stuff, and sometimes people are embarrassed to speak up and and say they do. Um, I have people. I had a guy just the other day on a job site. We we talked about stretch tape, and I said, "Have you ever used stretch tape?" And he said, "Yeah." And I said, "I handed him the stretch tape, and I said." Well, let's build the seal pan. And uh, he looked at me like I was speaking a foreign language. He had no clue what I was talking about. And I think he knew what a seal pan was, but I don't think he had any idea what the stretch tape was. Okay. So those are some of the some of the specifics for mock wall uh, site visit. Uh, there's there's the back of my truck. I'm I'm fully loaded to get to job sites and uh, help people out with product and uh, figure out if if they need stuff. But I'm I'm not the direct distributor, so I want to I want to make that clear. Um, getting out there and doing site visits, random visits uh, to the job site. Most owners and uh, architects and everybody out there want us to do random job site visits. We don't require them, but it's always a good thing to check in and then check the progress of what's going on on the job site. So you have line of sight, make sure that the product's getting there and uh, if there's any questions on that. And then I always like to walk the site with the, the, the uh, project manager or the super job superintendent or somebody that uh, you know, has the discretion to make decisions with me point out stuff on the job site and then come back and write any findings or any reports in a, in, a, in a quick email to them and give them kudos on stuff I see that are doing good and stuff that I'm not seeing, let them know and make recommendations to do that. Um, any, any questions so far? I guess everybody's on mute. <laughs> so um, moving on to, uh, to, to simplifying your life here. This is uh, a little bit about Henry. I'm gonna skip through this slide real quick. And I'm going to go uh, go into Henry Fortifiber. So many of you know Henry. Henry uh, Henry Company, who I work for, is a uh, is basically a building envelope company. We do everything from below grade to vertical walls to roofing systems. Uh, last January in 2000, uh, 2018, January 16th, I think is the date, we uh, purchased a company called Fortifiber. So we became one of the largest weather resistant barrier companies with the broadest category of product offerings out there. Uh, together, the two combined have over 170 years of experience and, uh, you know, the, the passion and the commitment for R&D. So we do everything from the, uh, the cheap commodity woven products to the non-wovens, the drainables, and then uh, the peel and sticks, which I'm going to show you here. That building on the right is a, is a commercial project, but it's a peel and stick project. And I'm sure some of you are aware of that product that's out there. And then we actually do have some fluid applied on our commercial side, but I'm not going to get into that too much. Okay. Uh, going back to the systems, so with, with uh, Henry, the way we're set up now is our system is set up to, to be a three-step component, okay? It's a mix and match. So you pick your, your WRB, your weather-resistant barrier, you pick your flashing, and then you pick your sealant. So those, uh, those WRBs can be anything from a Super Jumbo Tex, which is an asphalt-saturated craft down there at the bottom, clear up to uh, our, our WeatherSmart commercial or our, our blue skin. And then uh, flashings can be anything from from the uh, asphalt-based flashings, which are the commodity-based flashings, to the uh, the uh, fluid-applied flashings, which are the higher-end flashings, and then block copolymers or whatever. And then sealants, uh, you pick your window sealants. We have a uh, couple different sealant options as well. Um, go through that here in just a second. So I, I'm sure some of you guys have heard about the Blue Skin product. Uh, this is actually not a real new product, but it's new to the market in this area as such. It's been around for probably three to four years in the Carolinas. Uh, this product was actually invented by Muncie Bancor, a Canadian company, out of, or a Canadian company back in 1996. And Henry bought this technology back in like 97, 98. So this, where this product was really, where it got its pedigree was on the commercial end, and then they brought the product from the VP160 line to the VP100 line, okay? So these are some of the, uh, the key components of this product being a peel, peel and stick self-adhered um, building wrap, okay? Uh, you know, one of the big things here is the uh, nail seal ability. If you drive a fastener through it, you know, we eliminate the need for fasteners, but if you have a cloudy nail that's gonna go through it, it is gonna be nail sealable. You can see the mason jar down there in the right hand corner illustrating the water um, not coming out and you can actually ungasket that and take that gasket off that mason jar and it won't leak either okay so a couple more details there okay um, as an air barrier blue skin performs uh, pretty darn good 
Uh, we find that uh, in most of our case studies and blower door tests that we, uh, we achieve below two air exchanges an hour. Uh, that's without going in and propping up the wall system and doing anything special. Uh, if you compare that to conventional wrap uh, or weather smart or Tyvek or a Typar, you know, they're usually going to be around five to seven air exchanges an hour. And you all know the importance of that. There's a little caveat note there in the middle. It says improve the two, uh, improvement of two air exchanges results in about a 17 um, reduction in energy usage. And then you can see some calculations. So based on that, on 10 kilowatt an hour, you're saving about $461 in annual savings. And that's gonna vary across the, the country, okay? Uh, here's here's our, uh, our, our system. Some of our other system products are WRBs. Uh, the ply dry is the only one that's not included in there. That's a commodity woven product. Uh, but the, uh, the WeatherSmart building wrap is, the WeatherSmart commercial, uh, important note about that is the 12 month UV. So it's a beefier product of our uh, yellow product there. And then we have the WeatherSmart uh, drainable as well, okay? Uh, Jumbotex, uh, this product was actually the first weather barrier invented back in 1950 by uh, the Yant family. And uh, this supersedes, uh, or didn't supersede, but it, it came right after felt. Um, the biggest difference is, is this is asphalt saturated craft, so it uses asphalt as well. Um, and it is ASTM approved for sidewall or vertical wall applications and comes with a system warranty. So if in any case, if, uh, if uh, you're still using felt, a lot of times it's gonna be roofing felt for the sidewall. Uh, most of the time that is not D226 compliant. So you could run into some issues or litigations if you ever have uh, water intrusion or leaks. Um, and again, this comes with our system warranty if you do that one, two, three system. Okay, uh, flashings. Uh, I always like to do the uh, the, the self-adhered flashings and compare them to like going to the gas station where you have your 87, your 89, and your 90 octane. Uh, the asphalt's going to be your 87 octane. It's going to be a commodity-based product. It's basically uh, it has limitations in colder weather. It could weep if there's uh, changes in the, in the environment due to heat or uh, or uh, um, temperature temperature changes. Uh, butyl is more aggressive. Uh, you usually find it in thinner millage. Uh, it's going to be kind of in the middle. It's going to be that 89 octane. And then you got your, your block copolymer or your acrylic based flashings, which are going to perform down to zero degrees and they're going to go clear up. And then the one that we have is the FortiFlash 365, which is a 365 day UV exposure. Okay. And then, of course, uh, we have our uh, flex tapes and uh, we have a, a couple different types of uh, liquid applied flashing. Okay. So, and then speaking of liquid applied flashing, we have the moist stop sealant, which is a, a step formula. It comes in sausages and it comes in 10 ounce tubes. Okay, so this is a fluid applied flashing for the windows. Okay. Uh, one of the things you wanna watch out for system systems is the warranty. Um, to me, this is really peace of mind for the end user, the homeowner, um, but this just kind of gives us a snapshot of, compared to some of the other uh, companies that are out there in the industry. If you take a look, we're not saying that uh, none of the other manufacturers actually don't have these warranties, but if you look at all of them, we're the only one that has all four of these categories. Uh, the big thing with this is, is if you're doing a multifamily or a residential job, this is a transferable material and labor warranty. We do not require any paperwork or any receipts to exchange hands if somebody moves out of a house. Most of your manufacturers are gonna require that and they require a, a time frame for you to submit a claim. Okay, moving on. So some pictures of some projects. So blue skin is blue skin right now is more viable on the uh, custom high end custom side, but you can see some of these projects. These are these are projects that have uh, been in the market here uh, recently. Uh, the one up there in the top left hand cor uh, left hand is a about a 14,000, uh, 15,000 square foot, uh, several million dollar home down in Daniels Island. The one below it is another one that uh, was in Daniels Island. Uh, a builder actually specifically used this on his own personal house, uh, several million dollar home. We have a uh, another one there uh, in one of the islands down in Charleston, uh, that, that round home, which was a unique project to work on. And you can see the vertical application in the, uh, in the wall system too. So this product can be hung vertical and horizontal. And then the two there on the right are gonna be in the top cell, uh, north top cell, top cell beach area in, in the Wilmington market area, okay? Uh, a couple other projects. I like to show pictures. So a lot of a uh, lot of different projects going on around here. We got uh, at any given time. I think we got about seven or eight projects going on in the Carolinas and multifamily right now. Um, but you can see some of the different projects here from our WeatherSmart uh, 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 non-woven product. 
uh, or weather smart commercial product, which is kind of that that darker tan color, and then the drainable product as well. Okay, so different different options there, and then the super jumbo techs. Um, there is a perception of the uh, black paper in a lot of markets, but uh, it seems on a coastal environment, this stuff has worked for years, so people just they don't change. So uh, they uh, they believe it works, and I believe it works. This project's been around for a long time, so you get to see see uh, a full house in it. And these again, these these go back to the system. This is a full system warranty too, so uh, you get a 15 year transferable warranty. Okay. Um, I don't want to take up any more time. I think I might have overspoke a little bit, but uh, I got a, I got a ton I can cover, and I could I could spend a, a, a long time covering this. You see, I have 56 slides that I hid down there, so um, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Ryan. Anybody has any questions? Feel free to reach out to me. There's our website information, uh, my email there. Any way you want to get a hold of me, um, and then again, I have two counterparts. If you go to our website and do a uh, sales rep finder, if you got a project going on anywhere in the country, you can do sales rep finder and find us anywhere across the country or rep, or I can point you in any direction. Um, one last note is that we do have um, a, a, a myriad of architects and uh, we have over nine PhDs on our team that can help. So if you guys need some technical stuff, um, we are there to help you. Okay, that's, that's it, Ryan. Thank you, I appreciate your time. Yeah, great. Thanks, Josh. Don't go too far. I know we've got at least one question here, but I'll let you uh, catch your breath for just a second. That was a whole lot of building science and products rolled into 15 minutes. The way to go. Um, so, Josh, while we're maybe waiting for a couple of people to maybe put a question here in the chat box, so that's the uh, prompt that if you do have a question for Josh you'd like to address now, please uh, enter that in the chat box. But, um, Josh, we do have a question actually from one of your co-presenters, from Jarrett. Um, he was asking about an earlier slide. He said, was that radius wall segmented and then smoothed with stucco to make the smooth turn? I think he's complimenting you all on the work, it looks like. Oh, he's asking, what was that, Ryan? So was that radius wall segmented and then smoothed with stucco to make the smooth turn? I honestly, I, I I don't know. That was probably okay. after. I, I'm assuming that one project that he's talking about is the one on Daniel Island, which was uh, uh -huh. Ashley's Ashley's project, my counterparts, and uh, that house was pretty spectacular. I mean, it was it was basically built like a commercial project with steel steel and stuff as the uh, supports. Yeah, I mean, it was right. it was a pretty unbelievable project. Um, okay. No no money was spared on it. I mean, that's you're talking a thousand square foot a uh, uh, you know project. Right, so bringing, bringing building performance to the masses, uh, the folks on the low side of things and on the high side of things as well. So, yep. um, all right, sounds good. Well, thank you, Josh. Um, so I don't see any other questions, so I think I'll go ahead and move us along. And if you do have a question for Josh, um, please do put that in the chat box, and then again, we'll open up the line at the end um, and do questions over the phone. So, uh, Well, thank you, Josh, very much. Uh, we'll have your contact information again provided uh, in the follow-up as well as your slides. So appreciate you uh, being on the right today. Um, so next up, we're going to turn it over to Scott Kind with Spirit Sales Group. Um, and so Scott, I'm going to push a couple of buttons here um, to get you ready to present. And you should be off mute now and also have control of the keyboard. So Scott, let me know when you can uh, speak up and we'll go ahead and get moving. I think I'm ready. Can you hear me? All right. Sounds good. I can hear you. Cool. Um, yeah, so what we're going to talk about is some best practices. Um, there's a lot of information thrown at you already, but we wanted to kind of just walk through best practices and, and how to help you moving forward. Um, a little bit about our firm is we are a, a building envelope rep company that cover different building envelope products in the Carolinas and Virginia. And so over the next 15 minutes, we really want to focus on how to set you up for success, how to help you be successful in what you do when it comes to envelope, um, air barriers, insulation, those types of things. And so this is, uh, anyone that knows, this is uh, my, one of my kids' favorite characters. This is Russell from Up. And the reason that I've got him on here is he, in the movie, was a Boy Scout. And Boy Scouts are prepared. And so today, hopefully, by just getting on this call, you can, you can get a little bit more prepared on what to look for and how to prevent a problem. 
before we do that, let's just take a step back and look at where we've come. Um, obviously, things have really changed on in construction and wall types over the past 100 plus years, most specifically over the last 10. And one of the comments that we hear a lot in the field is, well, I've been doing it this way for 30 years. Why do I have to change? Well, we're going to walk through some of those reasons why you need to change. The main reason is how we construct walls with now air barrier and then continuous insulation and then fire requ uh, requirements, which Jared's going to hit on here in a second. All that stuff wasn't in the wall assembly, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago. So if we continue to do it the, the, the same way we did, we're gonna to continue to have problems. And I'm gonna share some slides with you of pictures on problem jobs as well. So as I mentioned, much, much has changed. Um, I'm gonna be focusing on air barriers particularly. And I want everyone to kind of understand and think about what exactly an air barrier is. It can come in lots of different shapes and forms, but its main purpose is to control air, water and vapor. Now vapor is, is very problematic in this market. And the reason is we have a lot of heating days, we have a lot of cooling days, and vapor is trying to, to fight that building to find a middle ground. And what, what we don't wanna do is we don't wanna allow that middle ground where vapor turns into water. We wanna make sure where that happens that we get that water out of our envelope. Because if we trap that vapor in our envelope, it leads to lots of issues. It leads to structural decay, it leads to mold, it leads to mildew, it leads to a lot of problems, a lot of the stuff that we see in the field every day. And so one of the ways that, that you can counteract that is to have a vapor permeable system. And in, in this market, it kind of it's it's a fluid number, but I would say probably 65 to 80 percent of commercial installations in North Carolina are vapor permeable. So this means that product is going to stop water, it's going to stop air, but it's gonna allow vapor to pass and equal itself out from a pressure standpoint. There are non-vapor permeable systems or vapor retarders, and those would be used in a couple different ways. One would be that if you had a, a, an owner or a building that had very tight parameters as far as what was inside, like a museum or a library, then you would use a vapor retarder and you would have very tight controls as far as your HVAC goes to make sure that your humidity level didn't get too high because in a museum that could end up ruining artifacts or paints or uh, paintings. The other time that you'll see non-permeable systems, vapor retarders, is going to be when um, certain construction types, certain insulation air barrier products uh, are non-permeable, and we're gonna talk a little bit about those. So just to recap what some of the basic types of air barriers that we'll see in the field, um, Josh talked a little bit about building wrap. I think that's probably the most common one that we see on a routine basis. We also see a lot of fluid applied air barriers, and those can be both permeable and non-permeable, um, or a membrane that would uh, most likely, most of those are gonna require having uh, a primer with it, but those can also be permeable or non-permeable. And then the other one that we see a lot of is a rigid insulation board, where you would um, use that as your air barrier. And then the other one that's not on here that we see a lot of is spray foam insulation. So why is all this important? Why are we going over this? One, it's the law. In North Carolina, with the new code, it, it's, it's implemented and it's the law. And when we talk about the code, let's just remember, that's the bare minimum, okay? No one's gonna, no one's gonna arrest you or get you in trouble if you design a better wall system, if you design a, a better thermal envelope, if you de design a better air barrier. The, the code is the bare minimum. The other reason that we want to we want to talk about this stuff and really kind of help educate people is we want to keep you out of trouble. And in our world, we see a lot of things done wrong. And again, it goes back to that education piece where people have been doing it 
um, a certain way for 30 years, but now as we've implemented all these things in the cavity, if you continue to do it that way, you're gonna get yourself in trouble and have big time problems. And that's, that's a lot of what we see. So again, it's to keep everyone out of trouble. So please, 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 let's just pay attention and talk through some basic things to look out for. And I think we'll all be better at the end of the day. So this slide is actually a fair warning. Um, for those of you that don't know Jared Davis, that'll be speaking after me, he's a big guy. So we got together and we were doing a, um, a Habitat for Humanity um, project and Jared asked me to get down and, and function as a sawhorse there and I had no choice, but that's just a joke. But um, obviously we wanna keep you out of trouble and not do stupid things like this. All right, I mentioned the code. The code now requires that your thermal envelope be identified on every commercial construction drawing. And in this drawing, we like to reference a, um, a tool in our industry called the pencil test. And that means that I could put a pencil down um, and highlight the outside of that thermal envelope with never taking that pencil off my screen or off the paper. And that means that our air barrier is gonna be continuous. And when we start looking at where the problems exist, they typically don't exist in the field of the, of the wall or the roof or the substrate. It's gonna be at our penetrations and it's gonna be at our transitions. And that's why I've highlighted these things. Those are the things that we wanna look out for and pay attention to. So again, as part of the new code, our condition space needs to be um, identified on the plans. But here we wanna talk about where those penetrations occur, how are we handling those? How are we at least identifying those? Because when we don't address those properly, that's what leads to issues. The biggest area that we see in the field getting missed is our roof to wall connection. Here I've highlighted a commercial building. This is even more problematic in a, uh, a residential application or a, a structure that has an overhang, trying to make that connection point. So obviously in today's world, we have a lot of stuff going on in this wall cavity. You can see that from an insula insulation standpoint, we have a lot of stuff going on. Our parapet's actually insulated, but we need to make sure that our roof is connected to our air barrier assembly. And this is easily accomplished by talking about this at a pre-construction meeting, bringing this to people's attention so the GC can think through from a sequencing standpoint, is this wood blocking gonna be there? Is my air barrier guy gonna be there before my roofer? How am I gonna make sure that those connection points actually take place? Because when we miss this connection point, that's very problematic. That's gonna allow a lot of, of all three air vapor and um, moisture to get through and then cause all those problems that we talked about earlier. And there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat. So it's just bring, making this um, just awareness to help everybody. So these are some of the problems that we are talking about. Um, unfortunately, that this did not take place on this specific project and it led to some issues and problems. So the top of our wall wasn't completely encapsulated like that was discussed during a pre-construction meeting, the GC chose not to do that. And then several months later, when the owner shows up, he actually sees um, coming out his weeps in that top left-hand picture, um, some white matter that he didn't know what it was. So then that forced them to take apart some of the wall system. And what they had found is, they did a test right here. And what they had found was that their air barrier system had re-emulsified. So they did not protect it properly and it ended up re-emulsifying and slipping all the way down the wall. So if you look here, you can see after two months of it being on, it is re-emulsified and you can now touch it. And here it's completely slipped off the wall. So this is just, uh, this is easily avoided if we can get everybody on the same page during a pre-construction meeting. The other area that is not as critical, but is often missed is our connection point between our below grade waterproofing and our air barrier. Obviously we've got a lot going on in this detail. We've got a lot going on at the base of the wall, trying to get all that water out. 
We want to make sure that connection point takes place. And the reason is, if we don't, um, water is going to have a chance to wick back up in into the, the building and cause the problems that we're talking about. So th this is a project along the coast. And, and the point that we wanted to highlight here is that this is real, that you will have, you will have water work its way into the building if we don't account for this on the front side. So how, what are some good best practices um, to set us up to win? And I think one of the biggest ones is material selection. Um, there's lots of different products out there. There's never one size fits all, but know the advantages and limitations of what you choose or what you're being asked to install. And for example, and, and this is a, uh, a, a manufacturer, it's a very good manufacturer. They have limitations to the chemistry for this specific product. And if you read closely, it tells you what those limitations are. This is right on their data sheet. It says, don't apply this product if it's gonna be 40 degrees or below, if it's going to freeze within the next 16 hours or overnight, or if rain is expected during drying time. So your next snack, natural question is well, how long is drying time well they tell you drying time is 48 hours two days basically at 75 degrees for every 10 degrees lower than that at a day so the manufacturer realizes that this is this is pretty challenging but manufacturers um, have plenty of smart lawyers working for them on their data sheets they put disclaimers to keep them out of trouble. Our job here today is to keep you out of trouble. So if you look down through the fine print here, they realize, hey, these conditions are very hard to meet. Um, when this is, occurs, in conditions such as these, it is advisable to tarp, heat, and ventilate the area or wait for better weather. Well, you as an applicator are not in a position to wait if the general contractor is screaming at you to go put the air barrier on. So again, knowing the advantages and limitations of the products that you're using. So it leads us into the next point. We did a study um, a couple years ago. We looked at weather data in 2015, according to NOAA. And we looked at cities and all the markets that we work in. And I'm gonna highlight four of those um, in the Carolinas and why this is important. So, we have a lot of hot days in North Carolina. We have a lot of cool days. We have mountains, we have the beach, we have a lot going on. So if you um, are restricted by temperature and rain when you can install products, I think it would be important to look at what the weather data says. So if you look here in Charlotte, North Carolina, the days that it's 40 degrees below, the single day that it's rained, not the second or third, but just that single day, um, excluding those duplicates, how often can I or can I not install certain types of products in the marketplace? In Charlotte, it says I cannot install that product 64% of the year. Well, guess what? You're still being forced to install those products and you are now responsible and liable when they have an issue or failure. In Raleigh, North Carolina, it's 52.6, 53% of the year, you cannot, you cannot install those types of products. In Wilmington, North Carolina, 60.5 or 61% of the year, you cannot, you cannot install those products. And in Asheville, it's 62% of the year. So our point here is to make sure you understand the limitations um, of what you're using, how do you set yourself up for success, and as an industry, we're, we're changing and evolving with new products um, to accommodate this. And unfortunately, here's what happens when you don't. Um, this is a, a project where a contractor was forced to use um, a specified product. This is his job along the coastal environment. Um, he came out and did the CMU wall. And he came back two days later. This is what it looked like. Of course, every day in the afternoon along the coast, it's going to rain. Um, and so this impacted his job. 
And unfortunately, this poor contractor had to do this job three times. Again, no limitations of what you're using. Another situation, the wrong product was selected on a large multifamily project. Um, within seven years, it had failures. All the failures typically occurred at your windows and openings and transitions. It performed fine in the field, but within seven to eight years, they were recladding this, involved in a lawsuit, and, um, and it's about a two-year project. So our firm currently is involved in anywhere between five to seven reclad projects, multi-million dollar jobs, where they're all 10, 12 years or younger. So again, that's why we're just trying to help you to get it installed right the first time. Because of improper installation, the entire wood decks were rotted. Um, all your, your deck sheathing was gone. In the walls, um, you had mold, rot, mildew. And the wall was actually coming off in pieces about anywhere from 18 to 24 inches. And as you can see, there's, it's filled with uh, mold and rot. So how do we avoid that? How do we win? As I said, we're starting to develop new products and new technologies. Um, a couple key points. Let's use systems. And Josh did a great job of talking about systems. Let's use systems, not just air barrier, but how we tie in everything in together um, with a successful track record. I say a good baseline is 10 plus years. Let's use systems that are conducive to the weather in your environment. I just went over that weather data and showed you how important that is. And, and those of us that are in the industry know that most manufacturers are racing to implement new products that work in, in these kind of um, environments or atmospheres. And then use systems that are easy for correct installation the first time. And what I mean by that is let's not, let's not put that added burden on our applicators to follow an eight to 10 step process to install a product um, that we know we're basically setting him up to fail. So we represent Prosoco in the Carolinas and Virginia. Their products have been out about 20 years and they came into existence um, based on a contractor's wish list. This contractor uh, was fixing a lot of the, the jobs that um, I've showed you pictures of, but he happened to be on the West Coast. And he said, these are the things that I want to go f install these, these systems correctly the first time and to fix them, you know, fix these mistakes correctly um, one time, not come back and redo these things every five to seven years. So let's look at the key things that he focused on. He wanted a product that could bond or be installed to a damp or wet surface. That's what this is. He wanted a product that was 100% solids. So what we mean by that is we install a product at 30 to 40 mils. If you install it at 30 mils, it dries to 30 mils. It doesn't um, get installed to 30 and dry to 15. So 100% solids um, achieves that. He wanted a, a system or a product that was waterproof immediately. He also wanted a product that could be exposed um, UV enough time for him to do his projects. He wanted a permeable system and he wanted a system that reduced steps or saved time. As I mentioned, let's not burden our applicators with a, a six, eight, 10 step process to install, install a simple flashing around a window. So how not to win? Again, these are some of the things that we see in the field that we burden contractors with, um, and some of them just struggle to get things right. Um, this picture, basically a contractor left off the um, primer, and that's gonna cause this flashing to fail. Most manufacturers are gonna offer three different types of primer a solvent-based, a water-based, and a VOC-compliant product. All those have different um, flash points based on temperature. Again, we're burdening our contractors to know all this. Next product here, this contractor did not apply the sealant at the leading edge here. 
And that's what caused this to, to buckle. He may not have rolled this either, but um, again, we're trying to put systems in place that eliminate all this burden for contractors to, to do all these steps. Um, this contractor should have not even installed the air barrier, but when he showed up, he saw the opening, he was told to go ahead and um, try to flash the opening, and we don't really have a surface or a substrate to apply our, our rough opening to. And this contractor um, installed spray foam, wrapped the openings first. It was a great um, installation, except the general contractor did not put the roof on, and that caused uh, water to get behind the spray foam and led to basically a waterbed effect here down the bottom. So, um, Prosoco is not the only one with a lot of these moisture cured um, flashing and air barrier products. But we're just going to kind of walk through some of the advantages of why you would use one over the other. Here, no primer required, it's seamless. Here, it's requiring that contractor to do all those steps. Scott, this is Ryan. We're going to need to wrap up here pretty quickly to make sure we have some time for Jared, if you don't mind. Yep. yep. So I'm going to go through two more slides here. So get the flashing works with just a, a you gun it and spread it. Um, and it allows you to get in, installed correctly without asking tape products to go through transitions to things that are going to be very problematic. Um, and then last, this picture on the left was a mock-up that we did actually while it was raining. So these products are waterproof immediately. So commercial and high-end residential, um, these type of moisture cured products can be installed. And it can also be installed with building wrap. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Scott. Lots of information, and again, we'll make sure that everybody has access to all of those slides from Scott uh, immediately following the webinar. So um, I think because we're a little short on time, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to Jarrett here. Um, so Scott, thank you very much, and we'll uh, move over to Jarrett's presentation. So um, Jarrett, I'm gonna take you off of mute. I think you might have to do it yourself, actually, if you're able to, and um, then give you the uh, presentation controls here. Uh, Jared, can you hear me? Jared, I cannot hear you, so I think you've got yourself on mute. And they need to enter the pen to get your sound back here. Hold on just a second, folks. So while we're waiting for Jarrett to get connected here, uh, just another reminder, if you guys do have any questions, please do put those into the chat box, and um, then we'll open up the phone line here at the very end. So, uh, Jarrett, looks can like you you're me? on. Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? I can. Thank you very much. Sorry about the trouble on probably my side there. So it looks like you've got control. So, Jarrett, I think we're ready to go. Yep. We'll try to jump right in. So a little about me. I am a recovering building envelope uh, consultant as well as a partner in a firm uh, here in the Carolinas and I've developed uh, products for Max Life. Now I work as a manufacturing engineer for Max Life and, and consult these products. Also sit on the uh, North Carolina Energy Code Ad Hoc Committee. So help develop these codes and we'll talk about that a little bit and kind of jump right into it because I know we're short on time. So uh, kind of moving forward a little bit, understanding that efficiency in labor and construction, um, you know, very partial to agriculture and farmers. I think they, Scott and Josh both did a, a good job, and, and, and as well as Brian, hitting on efficiencies and, and combining products and materials and what we've looked at. If you look at a study by the Economist magazine in 1947, uh, say we could make one hour per work in, in 1947, farmers and agriculture are now making 1,600 units per hour. Uh, in that same hour of work. So they, they've adopted technology in a great way to agriculture. Manufacturing, we're doing plus 800 widgets per hour. Uh, if you look at the construction industry, uh, in the 60s and 70s, we had a little bit of increase in our efficiency, but since then we've gone down. So this, this study was done in 2010. So our efficiency in construction has actually been reduced slightly as far as uh, what we can do and, and really understanding why that is. And that's really because of the codes. The codes are getting stricter and they're driving down. We're having more things that we have to deal with in our code. And really the first code that we had that, that came along was the, uh, the residential code and the energy code uh, in the 70s. 
And then we've driven through the commercial code. And we've had certain steps through that code. And really the driver of that code through time, if we look at uh, really when that first step was really kind of lead version one came out uh, and really drove that code down in, in the late 90s. Uh, and then ASHRAE 90.1 uh, kind of came in behind there. And that's what the energy code is now coming behind that. So we kind of see those steps and what we have in our driving code. And then, of course, lead version two is updated. So is ASHRAE. Now they're energy codes. And then coming th three and now where we are four. And we see that that use index of what available energy we can use for our buildings. So we're talking about commercial buildings in this case. And this is their energy use index or EUI. So if we were to build that same building in 1975, we could use a 100 or what engineers would call one. Um, and then when we go to that same building we're going to build today, we can only use about 53% of that energy, that available energy for that building. So we've got to get our buildings more efficient and more productive in what we do. So the code has kind of come forward and talked about what our efficiencies and effectiveness of our insulation. So this is the effective value table that's now available in the 2015 IECC as well as the North Carolina Energy Conservation Code. If we look at the way we traditionally built commercial buildings with a six inch metal stud, uh, 16 inches on center with an R19 bat, uh, our effective value of that R19 is only about a 7.1. So we effectively have been designing buildings for a, a long period of time with the bat insulation, assuming we're getting a 19 or a 23 or something of that, major, that, that nature. But really, when our commercial buildings, we weren't receiving that full R value. And that's when um, the code has now started to pick up continuous insulation to actually see that R value. And we do that because of our buildings. We say our studs are 16 on center, but are they really 16 on center? Do we really see 16 on center in all of our openings and, and around our penetrations? If we don't, we see a lot of blocking. We see a lot of uh, framing where our framers are referred in our window openings to, uh, to receive our windows. And with that, we have a tremendous amount of energy loss. Uh, in that thermal transfer plate, that steel stud in our commercial buildings. So our code has progressed to show those elements and all those different features and all those different uh, animals that we have to install within our code. And that's really driven by uh, the building codes, right? So we used to have to, the old Southern building code we had here in the South was, we have a, a copy of from 1940 on my desk, uh, my library here, and it's only about 20 pages. But now we see the IBC, you know, it's in competition to try to get as many pages in as the Bible. And then you have to reference the IECC, the, the plumbing code, the mechanical code, all the references we have to do. So our, our, our labor and efficiency has, has gone down dramatically in the construction industry. And as we know that, a lot of us in the, in the industry uh, are having a difficult time finding labor because it's, it's so cumbersome. There's so many things to do to find that education. And we look at all those steps that we have to do in a, in a commercial wall assembly. So we look at this assembly on the left of a, of a light gauge uh, metal stud assembly. We have to do so many steps to put into that assembly as far as your sheeting, your WRB, your drainage layer, your, 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 your woven mat, and then you finally get to your cladding. But this detail doesn't even include, you know, from 2010, doesn't include the continuous insulation. So we have so many steps that we do so our, to, to make our products uh, work and our buildings work to our design, our code to get efficiency where our buildings are better off. Uh, we have a, a, a tremendous amount of steps that we have to provide. So what we've done with Max Life and in our products is really to combine multiple these steps. A lot of uh, what Brian touched on a lot is efficiency uh, of combining one material that can do multi steps in our process to get our trades much better in our construction. And so we can do that one step to get to those six components in that wall assembly, and then our second step will be our cladding, the engineered system to cover that material. Um, so speaking of continuous insulation, we have to look at what the code now really says. So if we look at uh, the codes of what we use a lot in the commercial industry, the ASHRAE 90.1, and ASHRAE 90.1 has defined continuous insulation for a long period of time, for many years. Um, but now going forward for the first time, uh, the 2015 IECC now defines continuous insulation. And it now requires us to include that. And we've now brought that forward as well into the North Carolina Energy Conservation Code. So the game of being able to, to not do CI uh, is, is, is that loop has been closed in North Carolina. So we have to uh, install continuous insulation, especially on our commercial buildings with steel studs. Um, and we look at the definition of, of continuous insulation. Uh, straight out of the book is the material that's not broken other than fasteners and service opens. Uh, it, it, it's got to be a continuous material. It's got to be a continuous layer so that we get that efficiency in our buildings and our buildings become more efficient. As we look at the old way we used to do it, 
uh, say this is a, a two inch uh, XPS, we got an R10. It was very common for us to do the metal studs and a horizontal Z girt, a steel Z girt every uh, 24 inches on center, vertically going up that wall. So we're effectively breaking that R10 insulation. So it really wasn't continuous. This wouldn't meet the definition of a continuous insulation. So our effective value from an R10 is actually reduced to about an R4. Uh, so you're still not getting that efficiency that we're looking for in the code and while we're driving that step. But unfortunately, we still see projects, I think it's maybe one of Scott Kine's jobs, we still see projects that are still doing this process. This is uh, in the center part of, the, of, of North Carolina, uh, taken very recently on a job site, where we're still using those z girts to break that insulation. Uh, and that effectively doesn't meet the definition of continuous insulation anymore, so we no longer can do this detail in this, in this process of what we do in the continuous insulation because we're not meeting that intent of the effective value of the insulation that we need for the code. So we had some refinements of that. Uh, some folks came along with a, a different continuous insulation idea of saying we can still do those horizontal Z's because we've got to attach our cladding and hold those loads in our commercial buildings. So we did run a vertical Z over the horizontal Z's to, to attach the cladding to. So our, our, our thermal transfer may be less, it's reduced at this one point where our steel to steel connection is, but we still have a, a, a pretty significant amount of efficiency loss. And that efficiency loss takes that same R10 down to about an R8. So we're still losing 20% of that efficiency. Uh, so this does not meet the definition of continuous insulation for the code in the current North Carolina code either. So what we've gone forward now is to, is to come up with a solution of how to do continuous insulation that's not broken other than fasteners. And this will be a solution where uh, this would meet the intent of that code and would actually uh, not be broken other than the faster. So when we do that, our effective value is less than 5% loss. So we're still in that 9.95, 9.97 or so, because we're not breaking our insulation. This would be the solution that would meet the current in intent of the continuous insulation of our buildings and what the code now says, especially for commercial construction, because we've understood that that thermal loss in the steel studs is pretty great. So when we do that, though, we have this, uh, a lot of elements that come into, come into play, which is our fire. And a lot of you have understood and you've seen now when we start adding CI to our products, we start adding uh, issues where we deal with NFPA 285. We start adding the insulation to the outside of the wall. And if a lot of you are designing commercial buildings, uh, even some residential for that matter, um, that we have to comply with Chapter 26 of the code for insulation. Uh, that would bring uh, NFPA 285, any building that's taller than 40 feet or greater than two stories uh, would have to comply with 285. So our system, uh, our armor wall system that we've developed at Max Life, kind of our flagship product, is, is a uh, UL classified NFPA 285 compliant sheathing that would meet the 285 standard by itself, as well as also be able to comply with UL, e, uh, UL 263 as well as E119 fire rated wall assemblies. As you can see, the assembly on the right, what makes uh, Armor Wall very unique is that the assembly, the sheathing was actually tested without the need for cladding to pass the 285 test. And that's very unique uh, in the industry and, and unable to be matched because that allows us to do just about any cladding over that assembly on a commercial building. So uh, available to do some, some phenolic panels as, as well as other systems that was, was very unique that you couldn't do with other systems. This kind of gives you back that freedom of design to get the efficiency on your buildings as well as to allow that cladding uh, to attach to that sheathing. So that's where we get into our structural properties of the material and adding structural value to that building. Uh, and a lot of questions when we, when we say that cladding can attach directly to the sheathing, uh, what the drift is, what the downward force or the moment might be. So we've done uh, tremendous amounts of testing as far as shear value, um, as uh, the ability to provide shear into this, the steel front framing that is a non-combustible material, as well as to hold that cladding. Uh, so it's about 2,300 pounds of resistance of dead load, and the only reason it fails at 2,300 is because the metal breaks at that point. So we're able to attach that cladding directly to the assembly and not have to hit those studs which allows less thermal breaks and even get a better efficiency and better R value. And that fire ability combining to that allows that freedom of design for that designer to go back to the traditional system and be a much simpler design to be able to use those fluids that Scott and, and those self adhered systems that uh, Josh has also recommended and discussed uh, to get our buildings tight um, and providing that air, continuous air barrier and thermal insulation. So some, um, 
some solutions might be as far as claddings of terracottas or stones, uh, thin brick, masonry, and metal panels to be attached directly to that system uh, without having to hit the studs. So we can we can attach here and be able to do some things that uh, that you couldn't do in traditional wall systems, without reducing all those degirts and and thermal breaks uh, that we don't need to do. So this is a product uh, project that was completed in the Charlotte region as a nature research center. Uh, with this continuous insulated fire rated sheeting was applied directly to the studs with the factory applied WRB. And this provided a one hour firewall uh, to where the, the siding in this case was gonna be a wood siding was mailed directly to the furring strips that are attached anywhere in the board. They're not, they don't need to attach to the stud face uh, because they're able to hold that load and able to do that assembly that you couldn't do before many other aspects of the commercial construction side of the world. So it's a material that's gonna help you design that system uh, to do that freedom design on the architect. And see larger commercial buildings with the same fate uh, where you could, uh, in one step, in one pass around the building, you're gonna apply your continuous insulation, your structural sheeting, your fire rating, an STC of nearly 50, as well as your air and water barrier in one step. And that's gonna gain the efficiency of the building and efficiency of your project, rather than having to do five or six laps around a building. And that's really the struggle that we see with the current energy codes and the current uh, design of construction is how to do all these steps, but do it efficiency. I think uh, some of our other presenters have talked about it, is getting uh, labor and, and installers to be educated enough to do that. And, and the easiest way that we see to do that is to do it with a simple one-step approach that's already factory applied. Once you seal the seams and the fastener heads, then your project would be uh, sealed and dried in as well as code compliant all at the same time. And this product can be uh, designed to do multiple R values all to a continuous CI of R21 and still maintain that cladding and that fire rating. So a lot of variables there, a lot of value that you can provide on your material to meet that energy code in North Carolina, as well as the IECC to give that designer the freedom to do a lot of things. So Ryan, I kind of went pretty quick um, to try to keep us back to on time of a projected schedule here. Uh, but hopefully if anybody has any questions, I think you can open it back up to, to Scott and Josh and Brian and, and see if we can answer any of those and, and kind of go from there. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Jared. Appreciate you going through that um, very quickly, uh, but thoroughly. Um, we've had an awful lot of building science on today's webinar. Um, it's amazing what we can cover in an hour and a half, and I wish we had eight more hours of this. but um, but we don't. So I'm um, just going to check the chat box and see if there's any questions in here. Um, looks like we've got at least one, so just a quick check-in. If folks do have questions, please put those in the chat box for now, um, and then I'll do a little bit of a kind of a wrap-up here in just a minute. But um, Josh, it looks like we still, we got one question for you, so um, if you're still on the line, and kind of unmute yourself, or I can uh, do that for you here in just a second. Um, but we do have a question for you. Um, that's from our good friend, Mark, too many buttons here. Um, question from our good friend Mike Cap. Um, he says, Josh, for builders that want to achieve passive house certification with 0.6 air changes per hour, um, what building wrap would you recommend? And of course, it's okay for you to recommend your own, Josh, but um, which one would you recommend? Um, let's see if uh, we can get Josh back on for that. And Josh, you should be unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I mean, out, out of the building wraps that I sell, I mean, the VP100 is going to be the best. That it's going to get you the closest to it. Um, so uh, I can I can probably take this offline better than answer it on here, but uh, I would say VP100. Um, you're probably not going to achieve anywhere near that with any of our mechanically fastened products or even like a fluid applied product. You probably wouldn't be able to achieve that. I don't really want to defer that one to Scott, but he knows more about fluid applied than me. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yeah. The question is what fluid applied? Um, again, I think all of them are gonna perform if your, um, your, your transitions and all your flashings are done properly. Um, we just did a project that I think we were at like 0.6 or 0.7. It was not passive house. So um, a lot of those are going to be able to perform if it, they're detailed properly. Is 
Still there, Ryan? Yep, here I am. Sorry, I'm using my own mute button. Um, yes, thank you, Josh and Scott, for uh, uh, answering that question. We'll, we'll take a couple more questions here in the chat box, and while we're waiting for those, uh, let me jump through just the last couple of slides real quick. So um, first off, just a quick reminder, um, we are an association. So if you'd uh, like to consider joining the association, we'd love to have you. Um, we're open to all different types of companies and professionals in the industry. And again, as I mentioned at the start, uh, membership dues start at $25 per month per company. Um, information is on our website, of course, with an application. So if you're interested, please take a look at that. And then also, we um, have just announced that we will be doing our annual conference uh, about a year from now in Raleigh, so August, September of 2020. I'll be speaking with the convention center this afternoon. Um, this will be a partner conference. So we've got the Air Barrier Association of America, likely one of the national passive house organizations, some of the other state organizations here and uh, groups that have chapters as well to basically work together and have one big buildings conference for about 750 people or so. So look for information from that. We'll be uh, sending that out very soon. And if you'd like to get involved and talk about sponsorship or exhibitor opportunities, please do let me know. Here's the contact information for everybody that was on um, today's presenter list. Um, you can see Brian, Josh, Scott, and Jared here. Um, if you'd like to take a photo of that, go ahead. We will also send this out via email shortly. So you all will get that information and then also copies of the presentation. So I do want to make sure I just say thank you, um, each one of these gentlemen, for taking the time to uh, do their presentation. So that's my contact info as well. If you need anything from uh, us at NCBPA, please do let us know. Um, again, uh, we offer webinars like this at least once a month, and members have access to recordings of everything and much, much more. So um, with no further comments from me, um, since we've got uh, presenters on the phone still, um, Brian, Scott, Josh, Jarrett, you guys have any additional uh, just kind of questions or comments before we uh, wrap things up here? Ryan, I was just going to say, um, to the gentleman's question earlier, we have some case studies on our website too. You kind of got to go in there and navigate around, um, but but they're available on there, and I think they might answer some of his questions too. He can take a look. We have everything from uh, you know residential up to high-end commercial. Um, I think there's like five or six case studies online that kind of detail stuff and uh, give you give you some more answers on their exchanges and stuff like that. Kind of stuff he's asking about. Great, thanks, Josh. Yeah, Ryan, this is Jared. I'll comment on that too. I think, you know, I think Josh is in the point. The main point is is to use a system, but use it and detail it correctly. But you get what you inspect and not what you expect. So get with the guys in the field and make sure they install it correctly, because that's what's going to give you your best rating and your lowest ACH per hour is to actually the installation with the fluid applied, a self-adhered from, from either of these guys or, or a component from any of us. Uh, if you get it installed correctly, your chances of getting a lower ACH is going to be dramatically increased. And that's really where it comes down to using a, a quality product, but expecting superb installation is how you're going to get there. Yeah, this is Scott. I, I couldn't agree more with both those guys. Um, and I just say, you know, if you just reach out for help, I think anyone's willing to help. Um, just educate yourself, reach out to industries like NCBPA and, and folks like us on the call, and we're, we're more than willing to help steer you in the right direction. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Well, I don't see any additional questions in the chat box, so we'll go ahead and uh, take everything else offline. So, uh, Brian, Josh, Scott, and Jarrett, thank you all again for taking the time to help educate us today. Um, please get in touch with these uh, fine gentlemen uh, if you need any uh, support with your products or services or projects. Um, and then we'll be sending out the uh, recording and presentation here this afternoon, hopefully. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, please get in touch if you need anything else. And I hope everybody has a good rest of the day and rest of the week. Thanks very much.